Well, this is Current Affairs. My name is Nathan Robinson, and I'm here with Malika Jabali. Hello, Malika. Hey, Nathan. How you doing? I am doing, I'm feeling, uh, well, let's be honest with the people. I'm feeling uh, a little discombobulated. Uh, <laughs> I'm not in the Current Affairs office. I'm hunkered down. Um, it's Tropical Storm or Hurricane Francine is uh, raging all around me. I didn't know she had a name. They, I'm sorry. I'm sorry they, about that. They give all of the hurricanes very charming names so that when everything that you love is destroyed, <laughs> you'll feel a little, you know. Fondly about it? Little sympathy for the hurricane. That almost sounds like the subject of what we're going to talk about, you know, putting nice names on things that are kind of crappy for the American people. That's true. Gussying up yeah. things that are awful um is uh is kind of the th probably going to be the theme uh we thought we'd get together and uh wait no first tell people your what you do who i <laughs> we need to introduce hi. you properly hi everybody so as nathan said i'm malika jabali and this is kind of a full circle moment because nathan and i first became acquainted because i was working on a piece on Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm a journalist and an author of the book, It's Not You, It's Capitalism, Why It's Time to Break Up and How to Move On. And when we were first talking, I cannot believe it's been what, eight, like seven, eight years now? Like what's going on with the time? I'm so Your confused. piece was uh, 2019, 2018? It came out 2018 around oh, the midterms, okay. but I had started on it in 2017. Yeah. Um, that's I'm like, done. What a time warp. I just, I can't believe that. So we became acquainted because I was working on this piece on the working class and basically trying to up in the narrative or just expand the narrative of what that means, uh, especially because we were talking about what you want to say something. No, I just, I just want to remind people, these were the, what we would call the hillbilly elegy days of discussing the U S working class. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was just a cottage industry of, Thanks, J.D. Vance, for um, I maybe help eliciting that moment in time. But everything was about the white working class, and that's important. But the problem is that there was a very narrow framing of the even the white working class, which is these are Trump voters who used to vote for Obama, and now we got to win them back over with conservative policy. But mm -hmm. you have even in a state like Wisconsin, a lot of white non-voters who didn't vote because nobody was progressive enough. Um, a part of that, you had a lot of Black people who didn't vote because they're like, we don't like any of these candidates. So even though voter suppression is an issue, that became the dominating narrative when talking about Black voters and not the fact that, for instance, in Wisconsin, Bernie Sanders won the state as a socialist. He right. got his highest percentage of Black voters. He didn't, he didn't get a lot you know, in 2016 or 2020, but the highest amount in the primaries came in Wisconsin. So I was like, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on here. No one's talking about it. I was researching it for months. Nobody was picking it up. And then Nathan Robinson, well, first shout out Brianna Joy Gray. She was like, I know a guy. <laughs> and you and you picked it up, thank goodness. And then it won an award and that award led to a book. And now- and that was, That's the cool thing is that <laughs> you did not stop with this piece. Now you are living in Wisconsin. Uh, you <laughs> told me you left your, uh, your job. Uh, you're now doing this full-time reporting, uh, uh, turning this into a book. Yeah, yeah, we'll see how it turns out. Well, listen, I wanted I wanted to talk to you about uh, the uh, if I thought we could um, discuss what happened in the uh, the the Harris Trump debate, their first meeting. I thought we could just and the first I I, I proposed this topic to you so we could we could uh, discuss it because we could go through a couple, a number of the issues that did and did not come up. But okay. your first reaction when I. <laughs> told you I wanted to discuss this or the thing you said to me was uh that your main feeling has been one of profound and deep lack of interest and lack of ability to care about these candidates and the things they say is that but you say it in your own words that is basically it you know I we have and so you know just sort of step back a little bit you know i've gotten into more of my reporting work and as a journalist i've tried to steer clear of being partisan about things um and just being frank about you know where people are standing on the issues without necessarily giving prescriptions about their character and things like that um i'm also a human and i'm supposed to be reporting on this stuff and i care more about working class communities i care more about 
what their day-to-day -day lives are. And I'm feeling less and less inclined to pay attention to sort of the back and forth, really political circus that we've seen both of these parties go through, I don't know, the past seven, eight years, really since Trump has been in office. Like we've, a lot of people have been disengaged. When I, I remember first even approaching politics when I had the, the opportunity to vote and the immediate narrative was, we got to vote for the lesser of two evils. This is when John Kerry was was running. And I guess Dean Howard was one of the candidates as well. Um, and so since then, I've always known that, you know, at least on a federal level, electoral politics is only going to do so much. And so let's look at where we can actually make some changes. But I think with Trump being in here, it's just so much about entertainment and a circus. And then the Overton window has shifted so far to the right. It's just like, I've just kind of wiped my hands <laughs> clean of it a little bit. One of the problems, though, I feel like is that uh, on the one hand, one of the reasons that I can't help but write about, think about, discuss electoral politics uh, is that I feel very much the thing that you've said. And then also it's it's like a trap because it, it does matter and it does make it makes too much of a difference to completely ignore it. Yeah. Um, but I mean, the things that they're discussing in this debate, like a lot of the commentary is about, ah, well, she successfully baited him over his crowd sizes and look, he took the bait and you go, well, but none of this means anything. And this is of no consequence to anyone. Um, yeah. Then also the president is the most powerful person, I guess, in the world. Uh, they decide whether wars happen. Uh, they decide whether drone strikes uh, happen and whether, you know, uh, the war in Gaza continues. Uh, they decide on a number of things that uh, where the differences you sort of you sort of have to discuss. You can't check out from politics completely. No, you can't check. You can't check out from it, I think, on a like maybe personal level, but in terms of how much I'm willing to engage in talking about it publicly, mm -hmm. when I know like people are in their camps and not only are people in their camps, I think I was talking to a, an organizer out here today uh, in, in Milwaukee who just talked about it being demoralizing. Mm -hmm. So folks are in their, their camps, but also folks who consider themselves progressives or even leftists are now like getting wooed into this like Republican camp because that's what Kamala Harris is running as. Like, let's be honest, you've got an unhinged, you know, totalitarian on one hand and a Republican. Those are our candidates. So, <laughs> okay. you know, there are people who would vigorously deny what you've just said, of course. So let's, let's, we need to, uh, I mean, you have made the argument that she's running as a Republican. I, I think a lot of her Democratic defenders would say that's uh, that's outrageous. She's uh, she supports uh, raising the minimum wage, and she supports uh, that she, oh, I forget some tax credit for small that's businesses. Perfect. So can we can we get in, can we get into that a little bit and yeah. like why I say that? Yes. And I want to hear your thoughts about because I know you're talking about like people in general, but I want to hear your thoughts about you know how she's running. And so I think it's um I think it's a strange hybrid because she does have some of these maybe you know liberal talking points, but also a lot of really I would somewhat extreme, um, but definitely like traditional Republican ideas. And so she's sort of blending these two worlds together, like the child tax credit. That's not a democratic idea. That came from Republicans in the 1990s. You know, when she's talking about having the most lethal fighting force, including respecting our military and ensuring we have the most lethal fighting force in the world. That, those are words that Republicans yeah. use. You know what I mean? She said that in her speech at the convention, and she also said that in the debate again last night in her closing argument, she said America was going to have the most lethal, like, you know, murderous yeah. <laughs> fighting so force. It's not it's not like this is a, a gaffe, like she's double down yeah. on this. You Clearly know? the phrase she's like got on her list of, of points she wants to make. Yeah. And she's, yeah, she's making it clear. 
you know, when she talks about um, funding the police and, and letting people know that she she raised the resources for police officers, letting people know that she's a she's a gun owner. Of course, she's not trying to take your guns away. Tim Walls and I are both gun owners. We're not taking anybody's guns away. So stop with the continuous lying about this stuff. She might be a certified member of the NRA. Like, we don't know. But that's probably what she's trying to imply. The opportunity economy. How is that much different from the opportunity zone? Republicans were uh, proposed a $4,500 child tax credit. She what's, went up a little bit what's, more. What's dollars. the opportunity zone? I can't even remember that. Yeah, Some he other- had a, this whole thing was the opportunity zone. Okay. All yeah, right. that's that's a Donald Trump. Even that's Donald Trump right there. <laughs> right. Well, and just to to bolster uh, uh, what you're saying a, a bit, when you said she's trying to, trying to mix these two things, it was notable that in the debate last night, um, she touted the support of Dick Cheney. Uh, she also touted, however, the support of Sean Fain and the United Auto Workers. I mean, as she mentioned, uh, she had a she had a big thing about how um, uh, John McCain, I think, supported the Affordable Care Act or something. And, and Do- Donald Trump, look, you are a disgrace because the great John McCain um, who was a really quite nasty conservative Republican who came to look more like a moderate because the Republicans went off the deep end into far right quasi fascism, um, but you know who was singing "Bomb Iran" uh, back in uh, his heyday. Um, you know, so touting John McCain, Dick Cheney, and it, all she also invoked a lot of military leaders who opposed Trump, you know, and Trump's own, she would say things like, your own defense secretary, these generals who served under you, and it was all like the military establishment. Yeah. I mean, that that's kind of the sort of triangulation that we saw from a lot of third-way Democrats. And so you know, she is propping herself up as this, a new generation of leadership. But she's new in the sense that you know, she's a different race, a somewhat different race, um, different gender. But this is pretty much like the old third way Democratic playbook. She's like Bill Clinton, but without the jazz. You know, she oh. is just playing playing a different tune, but it's the same song. And and for people who don't remember, uh, I, I did a, a, a book about Bill Clinton uh, called Super Printer that people should look up if they want to learn more about the, uh, the this this horrific strategy that Democrats essentially embarked upon in the '90s, which was after the uh, Reagan era, they said, well, uh, Clinton and the and the third way Democrats essentially said, well, what if in order to win? Um, Clearly, liberalism is very unpopular. What if we just parroted Republican talking points and then all of the progressives would have to vote for us because they have nowhere else to go because what, are you going to vote third party? Uh, and uh, we <laughs> So, uh, and, and so and so they did. And I think in, in 1996, Bob Dole said, you know, oh, they stole my platform. I have nothing to run on. Yeah, that, that's where we are. That's where we are. And I think people forget that because, you know, we had this like wave of progressive politics and people tried to just sort of put her in that, but she never claimed to be progressive. She had always said, you know, that she wasn't going to, that she was a capitalist. She's not going to change anything. So I, I think we just have to remember, you know, who she is as a, as a person, even though she's under a party with a wide tent where people might believe that they can push her towards those things maybe they can maybe they can't I, I don't know but that's how she's running well you say she never came to be a progressive but she did sign on to a number of big popular progressive things at a time when it was fashionable to do so right so she signed on to oh, medicare for all uh and the green new deal oh, and- she raised her hand when i think the debate uh moderator asked her yeah, she's had she had a number of I mean, she in 2019, she actually said she was committed to a number of these things. And one of the things that's, that's quite interesting is that the Republicans are now accusing her of secretly believing all of those things and selectively moderating herself just so she can sneak her radical agenda in. Um, I think you and I would probably agree that that brief blip came about precisely because there was a moment where it seemed like politically wise to be progressive. 
Yeah, I mean, I do. I'm actually trying to remember now, Nate, because I know that obviously Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders were the most prominent with it. I think in order to get some sort of some sort of headway in that that electorate, some of the other candidates started to say that they agreed with things. But she, I guess, she dropped out so early, I kind of forgot. That's right. Like, That's where, right. Where she stood on on some of the other things that I that I knew that she promoted. Well, she and Pete Buttigieg too, I think, uh, said, you know, free college. They were all, because when that race began, Bernie Sanders was not the presumptive nominee, but since he had nearly beat Hillary Clinton, he was definitely considered to be probably the favorite of all of the candidates running. And so you saw people like Kamala and Pete Buttigieg sounding a lot more like Bernie Sanders than they ever had before or ever would again. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and that's a problem because, you know, speaking of where federal politics matter, yes, I mean, because there are going to be checks and balances. I think there's only so much that can get done because you also have Congress. Um, but I think a big, a, a big benefit is the national narrative and like what people think is possible, you know, because what I was talking about earlier is that you have progressives and even maybe some people who consider themselves radicals who are just like, I suppose Kamala is my only option here. If, you know, especially if I live in a swing state, so this is what I have to vote for. And so people are just like silently kind of either grimacing or nodding their heads when she's talking, you know, about making sure that we've got more police and making sure that, um, immigrants can't come across the border and all these things. People are just sort of accepting it. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, she did uh, pick Tim Walls as her running mate, who was the favorite of kind of left-leaning uh, Democrats that was considered kind of, of a surprise choice. And Tim Walls did a number of progressive things um, in Minnesota. But what's interesting is the, the idea that you, it almost seems like they're saying, well, you know, Look at Tim Walls. We must be progressive because we picked Tim Walls, but we're not making real promises, right? So when, when she actually talks, when you actually look at what she says she's going to do, and that was one of the things that kind of disturbed me in the in the in watching the debate, is I was like, okay, but, um, well, supposedly you and Tim Walls are people who we could expect to take the climate crisis seriously, for instance. But then she was doing precisely the thing that you identified, where it's like, um, running as a mixture of kind of a moderate Republican who's saying, uh, we're, we, you know, bragging about the massive increase in oil and gas production under Biden. And even the New York Times said it's a little unusual for a Democrat to be bragging about a, an increase in oil and gas production. But then also saying she was said in her answer on climate, We've invested a trillion dollars in a clean energy economy while we've increased domestic gas production to historic levels. <laughs> okay, so we've both saved the climate and destroyed it. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, and I think that's going to be a defining feature, at least of her campaign. You know, I don't, again, I don't know what she's going to be like as a candidate, but, or not a candidate, but as a um when she, you know, if she, if she does become president, but as a candidate, there's like a lot of sort of two steps, one step forward, two steps back, um, where we won't really know where she stands because a lot of the details are sort of muddled for most of this. As you know, she's, she finally has a, an issues page, which understandable, I don't think she knew that she was gonna be in this position, you know, um, People scrambling to go, what does she, she stand for? What does she stand for? Uh, let's come up with some things. Uh, minimum wage. All right, let's say that. That sounds good. You know, affordable housing, affordable health care, all great stuff. You know, so the issues page is still pretty, uh, pretty generic. Um, some of the things have some details. Some of them don't. But that gives her leeway to sort of to to be able to muddle it a little bit. Well, and you were talking about the uh, the way that ever since John Kerry, we've been told um, you need to vote for the, the lesser evil, 
and it's a very compelling thing in a way the more especially the more evil the opposition is right i mean in 2004 george bush had started the horrendous iraq war that was killing hundreds of thousands of uh, iraqis uh i mean Kerry had supported the start of the war uh but you know seemed like he would probably be more likely to not start other wars and it seemed like uh, i mean one of the reasons why the the lesser evil argument has such force is because usually there is a pretty bad alternative. And when you saw, I mean, when Trump was asked about climate change, what he said uh, was he went on a rant about Joe Biden and Ukraine, right? Because Donald Trump doesn't even, he believes climate change is a hoax. Drill baby drill is his platform, tear up all the environmental regulations. So it's like, well, it is better than that. Um, so it makes it very hard to resist because it, it's true. Like he is much worse. No, but it was interesting hearing them both talk. And so like on a performance level, like obviously she outclassed him because like you said, she baited him into going down all these rants. And I, and I wonder, does he even have a media team? Like, I don't think he has people who prepare him. He just goes off on absolutely whatever stream of consciousness he has in mind. And so I think when people see that, they just see, someone who is unhinged who probably is suffering somewhat mentally and a woman who's composed and she's composed against someone who's considered a bully and so in the realm of american politics unfortunately a lot of those details get get lost because you're distracted by the performance and it's been like that for for a really long time you know i think a lot of people got distracted with barack obama because he was attractive he was a great orator. I think when I I went to a Democratic convention back when I would go to Democratic conventions, <laughs> you know, he was he was heralded mostly because he could just he could speak. Yeah, and that's you know Kamala Harris is is oh. good at that, especially when you compare to somebody like Donald Trump. Well, what you're saying there uh, suggests something that might seem a little counterintuitive, which is like the more impressed by someone's character and presentation we are the more suspicious or careful we need to be because they could we they could be because that isn't substance that doesn't actually that doesn't actually mean anything right the fact that kamala harris is uh you know she had all her talking points uh she came back to her points she knew what she wanted to get uh she was very composed her facial expressions in the face of uh donald trump uh were delightful right they're all memes now uh she uh yeah she was on point she seemed to know her stuff um but none of that actually not a single uh <laughs> and for the fact that barack obama gives good speeches and have, has a nice smile uh doesn't tell you anything about what he's going to do for people um and i think the democrats were delighted by kamala harris last night uh, and and understandably so which is why then you miss okay but what did she actually promise? And then I, I started going through all the different issues. I was like, foreign policy, immigration. Um, wait, she didn't mention the minimum wage at all. Um, she didn't defend immigrants at all, even when Donald Trump said they ate pets. Um, and I was quite disturbed when I actually analyzed the substance. Yeah. Um, and going back to your the climate change issue, like it's, it's wild because that was such a big part of, I mean, it's been such a big part of our conversation with the Green New Deal, um, and even thinking about how to expand the workforce. Like there are ways to still make it feel, you know, like I'm a proud American. Like she can still do that and talk about climate change. And I'm not exactly sure why she hasn't gone that tack, like why she, why she was so timid about it. I don't know if you have any ideas on it, but I don't, I don't get it when there are, there are narratives you can sort of weave to make people feel proud of like American manufacturing because that there's opportunities for that. The Green New Deal includes a lot of that. Well, she did in her climate answer, what she kind of did was she said, climate change, I, unlike Donald Trump, um, I don't believe that climate change is a hoax. Uh, and she said, and you know, we've been, we had the Inflation Reduction Act, we've been bolstering American manufacturing. And then she got away from climate change entirely. Um, 
and just started talking about American manufacturing generally. She said that uh, Donald Trump lost American manufacturing jobs. Uh, she said she has the endorsement of uh, the UAW. Um, but she missed the opportunity. So she kind of did this. She's like, okay, well, can we frame climate change as, a, as an issue of actually we're building factories and giving Americans jobs? Um, and that might be politically, strategically smart, but you miss the opportunity to explain like, there is a very serious crisis and yeah. and that we are being warned about. And if we don't take action soon, the consequences are going to be devastating. In fact, they're already devastating. Look at the wildfires, look at the droughts, look at the heat records being shattered, look at the worsening storms. Um, we need a, you know global cooperation to tackle the most dangerous crisis of our time. And then that's totally absent because again, there's, there's this kind of acceptance of this. Well, the only thing Americans want to hear is Republican style rhetoric about how, about the heartland and jobs and factories. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but, and even with that, even with talking about the heartland and jobs, you can still discuss how it matters to the climate crisis, you know, being able to transition and being able to lift people up out of poverty, because I mean, that is what happened in the heartland. You had a lot of uh, low income families who were able to, to sustain their, their whole household based on manufacturing. And so what does that manufacturing then do for the climate when you, when you have, you know, solar panels and you've got, you know, right. um, you know, wind energy and, and all of these things. So she didn't even make the intersection at all because you know I heard that that part of her the conversation. And so her pivoting to manufacturing then led to Donald Trump only talking about jobs and then saying, well, Democrats don't have enough manufacturing jobs in here. We want to make sure everything's in America. And then I think the other thing that's missing when you talk about that is also race. The only, you know, and this is partly the an, an issue with ABC, the the host network for this, the only mention of race was when they were, you know, lambasting Donald Trump for denying the fact that she's a black and an Indian woman. And so with climate change, you can talk about the fact you're in New Orleans right now. You know, a lot of these predominantly black mm -hmm. cities or or largely black cities here and across the globe are impacted the most by climate change. These uh, the the global South is impacted most by what's happening in the industrial world with our defense being one of the largest polluters in the country, probably the world as well. So all of like even those intersections of race, she didn't even, she didn't even talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, what, what you said there, I mean, uh, there was a New York Times article about how uh, recently about how Kamala is uh, what, what was the phrase? Uh, she treads lightly on the climate issue or something, um, and is it, which essentially means she doesn't mention it uh, as a, any more than she has to. Uh, but what she pointed out there was that there's a really good way to the whole point, in fact, of the Green New Deal framing, which she has run away from and doesn't want to talk about or pitch the Green New Deal. But the whole idea of the Green New Deal, and we interviewed a couple of years ago one of the architects of the Green New Deal, Rihanna Gunn Wright, who told us about the fact that. It's it's designed to make it so that climate policy and economic policy don't have to be at war. So you don't have to have uh, labor and the environmentalists be antagonistic. Instead, you say, OK, well, we're going to solve the climate crisis. And in doing so, we're going to provide all these great uh, union jobs for people. And you can explain that. And if you explain it well, people will understand it and they'll like it. Um, but she isn't explaining that and so and one has to one has to conclude that she doesn't really believe in it and as you mentioned i don't think there was any mention of uh policing at all in the uh in the whole debate uh because you know the largest protests in american history up until that point occurred on donald trump's and donald trump's last year in office after the killing of george floyd you know massive uprising about police abuses of power um, all just kind of forgotten. And it's like, well, what are you going to do to reform police abuses? Oh, well, we're not even going to ask anyone that. Right. Yeah. So again, I think, you know, that was, it was a function of ABC asking the questions that, that they wanted to ask. But then I think as a candidate, if it's something that you genuinely care about, you can bring it up. So she could have weaved it in some kind of way. Um, and I think she's being deliberate about that, especially if she has run as being a top cop. 
and you run on law and order, like why would you bring up policing as a problem when you believe in law and order? So again, another Republican talking point. She's a law and order candidate who believes in reproductive rights. Um, she was asked the healthcare question. They asked her something like, uh, you know, you once said you supported, uh, they, they didn't say Medicare for all by name. They said Bernie Sanders plan to abolish private insurance and replace it with a government run plan. Do you believe in that today? Vice President Harris, in 2017, you supported Bernie Sanders proposal to do away with private insurance and create a government run health care system. Two years later, you proposed a plan that included a private insurance option. What is your plan today? Well, first of all, I absolutely support, and over the last four years as vice president, private health care options. But what we need to do is maintain and grow the Affordable Care Act. But I, I'll, I'll get to that, Lindsay. I just need to respond to a previous point. And in fact, she didn't. The first thing she did was she didn't answer that. She said, well, I want to go back uh, to some things that Donald Trump said previously, and I want to address them. And one of the things that she addressed in her health care answer was she said, I want to clarify, we're not going to take away your guns. Tim Walz is a gun owner. I'm a gun owner. I just need to respond to a previous point that the former president has made. I've made very clear my position on fracking. And then this business about taking everyone's guns away, Tim Walls and I are both gun owners. We're not taking anybody's guns away. So stop with the continuous lying about this stuff. She's using up her health care answer time to emphasize her credentials as a gun owner. And at no point in the debate said there's a crisis of gun violence in this country that needs to be addressed through sensible, in part through sensible gun control measures. Um, at no point said that. And then when she did get to health care, the answer was, uh, I'm going to strengthen the Affordable Care Act in these unspecified ways. And again, to go back to something you use in the Affordable Care Act, that too came out of a Republican a uh, conservative think tank originally, right? That was, that was built off of the kind of Romney care idea of you don't have a government plan. Instead, you just, um, you know, have a central government run facilitation of people getting private plans. With marketplace. I mean, and speaking of Mitt Romney, uh, he was the one who had proposed, I think, the increase in the child tax credits to like $4,500 or something like that. So, yeah. you know, I, we're, we're getting the, the, the binders full of, of women, except we, you know, we've got an actual woman now who's proposing his plans. Oh. So we didn't get Mitt Romney before in 2012, but you know, I guess Kamala Harris is taking up the mantle. And you know, and I do want to say this too because I, I think there's a lot that there are still questions about who she is. You know what I mean? I think people can look at her record as a as a DA. They can look at her record as a attorney general. And there have been some advances, you know, we, we can't deny like some of the work that she has done. Um, she cares about care workers. She talks about reproductive rights. I think she told it was, a you know, compelling stories about making sure that women aren't basically forced into abortions. Like all of those things matter, but yeah, I do, answer was good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I do think as a woman and also as a, a, a mixed race black woman, she might have felt pressure throughout her career to double down on some of the this um, this conservative tack. She probably feels that she has to be more um, assertive. I, that's not really not even, that's not even the word that I'm looking for, but she has to appeal to to that electorate who believes that women are too weak to make decisions about these kinds of things and I don't know if she's overcorrecting because that is a a way for her to win I mean she she made it to almost the White House at this point or is she is in the White House you know so it's worked for her so I, but I don't know how much of that is strategy and how much is that she fundamentally believes in it's hard to prove, but when I it's always kind of suspected that that had something to do with Hillary Clinton's hawkishness to this, this need to prove that you could be just as good at, ag at agitating for war. Um, the, and there is a powerful like DC consensus. Like there are all these pressures to 
the way that even the way that the media frames questions uh when cnn interviewed her they asked her well why did you and joe biden wait three and a half years to impose sweeping restriction on asylum so restrictions on asylum during the biden harris administration there were record numbers of illegal border crossings why did the Biden Harris administration wait three and a half years to implement sweeping asylum restrictions. Now, that is an ideologically loaded question because it implies that you should be restricting asylum um, and, and cracking down on asylum seekers, and you should have done it earlier. You could ask a different question, which is why did you and Joe Biden decide to spend your time cracking down on people fleeing persecution and seeking asylum in this country? That would be a very different question. But all of the pressures are things like, you know, well, would you be willing to press the nuclear button? That's a question that uh, in the UK is always asked of uh, potential prime minister candidates. They ask, would you be willing to like use a nuclear weapon? And if you if you don't say yes, then you're like not a serious uh, person. You can be dismissed. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I mean, we overall just live in this capitalistic, militaristic society. It affects every aspect of our social lives, uh, including our media. And so, you know, that's why outlets like Current Affairs are so important to pierce through that, because I, I know a lot of people are like, I know I'm not going crazy. Like, are, why are we normalizing this? Yeah. But the I mean, it's propaganda that we've gotten for as long as we've had mass media in this country. And if this is what the the norm is, it takes a it's going to take a lot I think to undo that. Yeah, I think one reason why we have why we've started current affairs and why it exists is to try and help people see through things that see through mythology and propaganda to learn critical thinking and to notice things that you're not necessarily going to notice. So like you could watch that debate and again, you could pay attention to uh, the the way that Donald Trump was, you know, you know, uh, incoherent and raging and Kamala's poise. Um, you could also pay attention to some of the particular issues that came up like abortion and you could have a conversation about that. But then there are things that it's like, well, you need to make sure you don't miss this. And so th those would be things like the fact that Kamala on immigration didn't spend a single sentence defending, she didn't have a single positive thing to say about immigrants or immigration, right? Didn't even give boilerplate like, will immigrants come to this country not to eat your pets, but to look like to, to work and to send their kids to school and to have a life like you do. And she didn't, re she didn't, give any real attempt to paint a different portrait of the immigrant community than the one Donald Trump. She said, oh, that's extreme. And then in her response, she pivoted to talking about how Dick Cheney endorsed her, right? No effort to defend immigrants. Uh, and on foreign policy, she was saying that he was too soft on China, too soft on North Korea, and uh, that he had invited the Taliban to um, Camp David, right? So these things where you're trying to like, outflank Trump to the militaristic right by saying, well, you're coddling terrorists or you're too soft on China. Yeah, I mean, and, and I guess there's really not a whole big long-term strategy for Democrats per se in terms of their policy priorities. It's more so, can we win this next phase of, of office and what the long, I mean, they didn't even want Barack Obama. Like, let's be real. He was kind of he was an underdog. They did not expect him to surpass Hillary Clinton. And so we would have been having more of the same. So I think they're perfect. They were perfectly fine with Joe Biden for a while until everyone was like, what are y'all doing? So I think they're okay. They're okay with the yeah. status quo. And this is what yeah. I, I, I was with, a, with some, with some friends. We we're at, um, at a baby shower and as friends do who like to talk about politics, we were talking about politics before we were at, at like the pregame for this baby shower. We're talking about the debate. And they're just like, why are they still allowing Joe Biden up there? And from my experience working in New York politics, the Democratic Party is a club. They care about their people getting promoted in, you know, whatever highest office and position that they have in that club. And the policy kind of takes a back seat. And what the ramifications are for the average American resident takes a back seat as long as their guy or a gal gets in position when they're supposed to get in position then it's all good and they just keep the the machine turning
And I do think uh, that that is confirmed by the fact that nothing ever happens without external pressure from organizing, from popular movements. Nothing, nothing ever takes place. They're not going to hand you anything, right? The only reason Kamala ever had good positions was external political pressure. Joe Biden only ever had uh, good positions on climate because of external political pressure from uh, the Sunrise Movement. Like they have to be squeezed in order to do anything. <laughs> yeah, and and I'm really, and I think we talk about the dangers of the Trump presidency. I think the the danger of a of a Kamala presidency is the fact that people would would become complacent, and not just com and complacent, but also would feel um, a little to maybe pressure to not confront her because it could be mistaken as racist or sexist, or even as if you are a black organizer or if you're a um, black nonprofit executive or advocate to feel like you're betraying the race by even critiquing her. And that, that's really, that's, ups that's upsetting. You know, the, the fact that that's probably going to be a thing to this day as, as a black woman, I can't really critique Barack Obama in certain settings the way that, you know, that I might otherwise, because, He's beloved. Like I was talking to a homie of mine and it's like, you've got Jesus, Barack Obama and Martin Luther King, you know, Barack Obama replaced JFK on some of our grandmother's mantles. Like literally going to my grandma's house, she got the cross and Barack Obama right next to it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So what do you say? What do you say to that? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you, you got to choose your battles. So sometimes you can't say anything, but for advocates who who do this work and they're, they need to pressure the, the Harris administration I think that's where that's where some of the concern lies because folks are are probably going to be shunned from really trying to challenge her in certain ways. So I'm I'm curious to see what's going to happen. Yeah, and I think there will be without pressure, without people willing to confront her, that this this kind of drift, this rightward drift of Kamala, where she's abandoning progressive policies one by one by one. Uh, I think I mean I think it's going to continue. It's going to get it's going to get worse. Um, and, and that deeply worries me as much as the Trump presidency worries me. Okay. So, uh, well, like a Jubali, thank you so much. That was fun. I, I thought we had a good time. <laughs> that was, yeah, that was. Thanks, thanks for having me on.